This is a video breakdown on how this low poly stylized washing machine was created. Here's what the final model looks like as we look at it through Marmoset Toolbag. Let's find out how something like this can be made. The low poly model was created through box modeling, which essentially means starting out with a simple geometric shape, in this case a cube, and using that to create the shape of the final model. Because this model is relatively low detail and low poly, the best case use for a prop like this would be for a top-down camera view where you don't see the model up close or as a model which is used in the background. For the buttons, I use the same process of creating simple geometric shapes and placing those together. A washing machine has multiple buttons, but in this case I wanted all of them to look the same. It was for this reason that I only modeled one and later made duplicates which share the same UVs and thus the same texture space. For the main body, I also added an extra extrusion on the back to give it more points of interest. I also created a cable on the back of the main body, this was done by using a curve. In the latest version of Maya, you can simply select a curve and use the sweep mesh tool to give it thickness. This tool comes in very handy for things like this. Once I had the back cable created, I also reduced some of the topology as I wanted to keep this model somewhat low poly. One important aspect of modeling is to keep geometry density consistent across different parts of the model. Just like you would keep the texture density across different parts of the model consistent, the same is often overlooked when it comes to geometry density. And just like that, the low poly model phase was completed. The next step was to create the UVs. For UV cuts, I typically like to make those where there is a near 90 degree angle change in the geometry. It is also important to make UVs in areas where they are hidden from view or player view in the case of a video game. The reason for this is to avoid making UV cuts noticeable as they can become visible depending on the texture resolution that you end up with. It is also good practice to keep UV shells straight in the UV window and not have them placed at angles. Depending on the texture resolution, if you have a UV shell at an angle, it is most likely to result in things like artifacts wherever you draw a straight line. For the cable, I decided to straighten the UVs as I planned to add a pattern to it in Substance Painter. It's typically better to have straight UVs for something like that. In this scenario, notice how there is an issue with the UVs near the elbow of the cable. The UVs here are stretched. To fix something like this, you would need to manually move some of the UVs in the UV shell until you no longer have that stretching. This is something that was not fixed during the making of this model, as seen in the final texture render, but definitely something to keep in mind when straightening UVs. The last thing to do is to pack the UV shells in the UV quadrant, making sure to use as much space as possible. Any space which is not used is essentially wasted pixels on a texture. While packing is important, it is also important to keep in mind that there will be occasions where the whole space cannot be used depending on the shape of the UV shells, but as a general rule, it is important to use as much space as possible. Before exporting the low poly model, I prepare the model by naming each piece with the suffix underscore low. This is because I will be baking in Substance Painter using the Bake Pie Mesh name setting enabled. For the buttons, I duplicate the original one and place it accordingly. These duplicates share the same UV space as the original. I prefer to offset the UVs by 1 in the UV quadrant with anything that is sharing UVs. This is because I find that sometimes Substance has trouble making textures on things that have overlapping UVs. For the high poly model, I duplicated the original low poly folder, renamed the files to use the suffix underscore high, and beveled some of the geometry. In Substance Painter, I used the default project settings. For the bake settings, I typically like to bake at a semi-high resolution. You can always lower the resolution later if necessary. I'm also baking using the setting of Bake by Mesh Name. I like to use this setting to avoid any baking artifacts between pieces of the model, especially where pieces intercept. Baking the maps for something like this is really quick as the software doesn't have to load up a really high poly model. For the textures, I use the 3DX Stylized Smart Material 2.0 which you can find a link to in the video description. The texture for this model is very simple as it is for the most part just one color. 
I added a little bit of dirt or wear at the base of the model to give it a bit more visual interest. Some details like the door and panels I created by using a layer with height enabled. This essentially works to create some fake details through normal map information on the exported texture. I used that process to also add vents on the back of the body. The same technique was also used for the cable on the back, where I ended up using a layer with a stripe pattern applied to a fill layer. Because the UVs for the cable were straight, this made it a lot easier to apply a repetitive pattern on. Had I not straightened the UVs for the cable, it would have been more difficult to get the pattern to align and tile on the cable correctly. The last thing I did was to add a color stripe at the base of the body to give the texture just a bit more visual interest. So that's how this simple prop was created. If you have any questions about it, just let me know in the comments section below. If you like this type of video, take a look at the channel to find more videos like this one. Alright, take care everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.